Lover of leaving Oz is no caravan of despair Come yet again, come Welcome, everybody. Can you hear me now? I just want to remind those of you who are, might have a, a mild hearing issue, we do have these hearing headsets. I'm sorry, I turned my head. We do have these hearing loop heads, uh, headsets if you want, want them. They're in the um, foyer. So. Welcome, dear friends, as we say every Sunday morning. Welcome to our spiritual home, the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tarpon Springs. Our church is located here in the heart of the walkable Tarpon Springs Historic District and is known as the home of the Inner's Paintings. My name is Judy Pickett, and I serve on the Board of Trustees as treasurer, and I am serving as your worship associate today. We are a church of many welcomes, and we offer a warm welcome to all who have joined us today. This is a liberal community for all ages, promoting spiritual growth, social justice, and the arts. As such, ours is an active church, and everyone is invited to participate in any of our activities, whether you're a member or not. To learn more about events, our church calendar is on our website, uutarpin.org, or you can discuss activities with church members. For those present with us in the building, we have connection cards, and if you're visiting us for the first time, please take a few moments and fill it out and put it into the offering plate, and we'll make sure that you are contacted. Um, there's also a card if you wish to share a joy or a concern. You can fill one of these out, put it in the offering plate, and we'll read it at the end of the service. Today, we're really delighted to have Aaron Powers leading the service. Aaron is, is a free-range Unitarian Universalist. Is that right? Religious educator from the Tampa area. Aaron is inspired by the interconnections woven throughout humanity and the greater living world. Aaron, they, them, is a free-range Unitarian Universalist whom we can learn how to build stronger community by paying attention to the rhythms of nature. Erin begins her seminary journey toward chaplaincy this fall at United Theological Seminaries in the Twin Cities. Today, our music is provided by our own Peter Grace. There will be singing through the service, and you're welcome to sing along wearing a mask to the songs and hymns. Again, welcome. Spirit of life, come unto me, sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion, blow in the wind, rise in the sea. Giving life the shape of justice, roots hold me close, wind set me free, spirit of life, come to me, come to me. Right now, I want. We light this chalice as a beacon of hope for those who have gathered here this day. For all who have ever walked through our doors are those who may yet find this spiritual home, and for those whose paths will never come our way. Good morning, all. I'm delighted to be with y'all and see some faces I know and uh, some new friends. So our story today 
It was written by Polly Peterson, and it's called Learning by Heart, and it is about Sophia Lyon Foz, who is a special person to me as a religious educator. Um, she's kind of the uh, forebear of the way we do UU religious education at this time. Mama, Mama, why do we just keep going and going and not going anywhere, asked little Sophie. Her family was crossing the wide Pacific Ocean on a big ship bound for America. Sophie Lyon was an American girl, three and a half years old, making her first trip to America. She and her older brothers had all been born in China where their father was an evangelical Christian minister and their mother had started a school for Chinese girls. And when they made the long trip to America in 1880, Sophie's parents thought their family would go back to China after one year. But the plans changed and Sophie never returned to China. And as she grew up, her memories of China grew dim. But she hoped that when she could grow up, she could go to other countries as a Christian teacher like her parents. In college, Sophia joined a club for young people who also wanted to become Christian teachers. She met another devoted volunteer named Harvey Foz. They began writing letters to each other and made plans to travel and teach together. Six years later, they were married. But instead of traveling to another country, Sophia and Harvey moved to New York City. Harvey had a job, and Sophia Lyon Foz taught Sunday school and continued her studies, excited about the new ideas she was learning. Sophia and Harvey's first child was born in 1904. And in those days, many women gave up their outside work after they became mothers. But Sophia was determined to keep learning and to keep teaching Sunday school, and she did. And as it turned out, being a mother also helped Sophia learn. She learned about children from being with her own children and listening to their ideas and questions. And when her children asked questions, Sophia tried very hard to answer them. Her children had very interesting questions. Like, where does snow come from? And where are we before we're born? As she tried to answer her children's questions, Sophia learned how much she did not know. And you might think that not having all the answers took away Sophia's faith, but it was the opposite. She started to believe that to have a strong faith, finding questions you really care about, is just as important as finding answers. And one time when Sophia taught a religious education class, she told a lively story about a real person who had been a Christian teacher in another country. The children were eager to hear the story and eager to talk about it. And like her own children at home, the children asked questions the interesting kind of questions that let Sophia know they were thinking and learning. Sophia's ideas about religion changed over time. As a young person, she had thought that Christianity was the one true religion and people all over the world should learn Bible stories. She grew to realize that the Bible was not the only book with truth in it. She collected stories from all over the world, filled with truth and beauty to help children's spirits stretch and grow. And she published the stories in a book called From Long Ago and Many Lands. And in those days, when most adults thought children's minds were like empty jars to fill with learning, Sophia thought differently. She thought that children were more like gardens, already planted with seeds of possibility for learning and growing. She thought a teacher's job was to provide the good soil and water and sunlight a garden needs to grow. In religious school, a teacher could help children grow in their spirit and faith. 
And when Sophia Fawes wrote about her beliefs, the president of the American Unitarian Association was impressed. He asked her to talk to Unitarian religious educators. Unitarian Sunday school teachers liked her ideas very much. And that is why, when you come here, no matter your age, we encourage you to see and touch and do and ask lots of questions. And when she was 82 years old, Sophia became a Unitarian minister. Her own life was a great example of her belief that every person should continue to grow and every congregation should also. Everyone from the smallest child to the oldest adult. Sophia Fawes lived a long, long time, 102 years, and she never stopped learning new things. If she were alive today and came to visit us, Sophia Fawes would want to know about our experiences and how they have helped us learn and grow. She would want to know what stories we had read and how they helped to awaken our spirits. She would want to know how we ask questions, seek answers, and learn from each other. Imagine how happy she would be to see us watering one another's seeds of spiritual growth. And with that, our story ends. Now is the time in our service where we take our offering for the work of this welfare of this church. Ours is a free faith which must sustain itself financially. You can go to our website, uutarpin.org, and click on the donate button, or you may mail your offering to our church office at 57 Reed Street, Tarpon Springs, Florida, 34689. For those of you with us in person in the sanctuary, place your offering in the offering plates as they are passed. And thank you. Um, let me just offer a little disclaimer here about the lyrics to the song. Um, Ordinarily, we wouldn't sing a song like this in church, but we're using this song to juxtapose the evolution of John's thinking as a younger man to his thinking as an older person when he met Yoko Ono and got married again. And uh, so anyway, that explains that, okay. <laughs> And by the way, uh, later on in life, John was quoted as saying that he always hated this song anyway, and I guess <laughs> it kind of explains something. I'd rather see a dead little girl than to be with another man. You better keep your head, little girl, or you won't know where I am. You better run for your life if you can, little girl. Hide your head in the sand, little girl Catch you with another man That's the end, little girl You know that I'm a wicked guy And I was born with a jealous mind And I can't spend my whole life Trying to make you go the line You better run for your life if you can, little girl Hide your head in the sand, little girl Catch you with another man That's the end, little girl Thank you, Peter. All right, so our reading today is also by Sophia Lyon Fawes. We can find her influence all throughout our faith. She says, it matters what we believe. Some beliefs 
are like walled gardens. They encourage exclusiveness and the feeling of being especially privileged. Other beliefs are expansive and lead the way into wider and deeper sympathies. Some beliefs are like shadows, clouding children's days and fears of unknown calamities. And other beliefs are like sunshine, blessing children with the warmth of happiness. Some beliefs are divisive, separating saved from unsaved and friends from enemies. Other beliefs are bonds in a world community where sincere differences beautify the pattern. Some beliefs are like blinders, shutting off the power to choose one's own direction. And other beliefs are like gateways, opening wide vistas for exploration. Some beliefs weaken a person's selfhood. They blight the growth of resourcefulness. Other beliefs nurture self-confidence and enrich the feeling of personal worth. Some beliefs are rigid, like the body of death, impotent in a changing world. Other beliefs are pliable, like the young sapling, ever growing with the upward thrust of life. And I wanted to add a few of my own thoughts to this. It matters that we examine our beliefs regularly. It's easy for us to grow complacent and lean on the familiar, to slip into the mainstream of patriarchal, white-centric, cis-heterocultural beliefs that leave little room for anything outside of its rushing waters. It matters that we listen to and respect the lived experience of those who have been historically excluded from the larger discourse. There is wisdom in each of us, and when all can be equal collaborators, we are blessed with exponential gift of ideas, new ways of doing and being, and new wisdom to be carried for generations. And we are wise to remember that what is now traditional wisdom was once radical and shocking at its inception. And now on to our sermon. So I wanted to reintroduce myself. My name is Erin Powers. I use they, them pronouns. And I'm a non-binary person raised as female in this patriarchal culture. Coming into myself as a non-binary person in this patriarchal culture took time because there is little space for anything that deviates from the rigid constraints of cis-hetero nuclear family ideals. One must carve out this space, and it takes time and energy. I am non-binary as a direct affront to these rigid imaginary structures that only serve to hold us back as a people. I am non-binary because I contain multitudes that cannot be confined to narrow and prescribed constraints. And I give you this longer introduction today because I'm speaking about misogyny and women in our Unitarian Universalist faith. And when we speak of the challenges of living within this dominant culture, women, trans people, and non-binary folks share many similar experiences and challenges. And when I speak of women today, know that I am speaking for all who fall outside the category of cisgender men. And it must be noted that while our patriarchal society is designed to shift power to white cisgender men, it harms them as well. And I also acknowledge that in one of the many ways that colonization has stolen life and liberty, I live on the stolen ancestral land of the Tokabaga and Seminole peoples. The Tokabaga were completely lost to genocide. And while the Seminole have preserved, it has been rife with undue hardship, 
pain and loss. There are no doubt peoples unnamed, lost to my own current knowledge and that of our larger community. I acknowledge and grieve for them equally. And this knowledge pushes me to be a good steward of the land that supports my family and my community. And I'd like us now all to take a collective breath. Our Unitarian Universalist faith supports us as we hold difficult truths and it energizes us to act, to create a different future for ourselves and for generations to come. Pausing to breathe is a vital tool for helping us to hold heavy truths without being immobilized. Let us take one more breath. As you use, we are proud of the women in our history and of the roles and stature many held. One of our early Unitarian matriarchs, Abigail Adams, is quoted as saying in 1776, if particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to torment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Mm -hmm. And here we are again. And nearly a hundred years later, in 1845, Margaret Fuller wrote in her groundbreaking book, Women in the 19th Century, we would have every arbitrary barrier thrown down. We would have every path laid open to woman as freely as to man. Were this done, and a slight temporary fermentation allowed to subside, we should see crystallizations more pure and of more various beauty. We believe the divine energy would pervade nature to a degree unknown in the history of former ages, and that no discordant collision but a ravishing harmony of the spheres would ensue. Yet then, and only then, will mankind be ripe for this, when inward and outward freedom for woman as much as for man shall be acknowledged as a right, not yielded as a concession. And her work inspired future Unitarian and Universalist and Unitarian Universalist women, such as Olympia Brown, Lucy Stone, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, Mary Livermore, and many others known and unknown. And we still feel their uh, effect today. This radical for its time idea that women's equality is a human right has been a struggle for Unitarian Universalism alongside our country. In many ways, we have progressed faster than our larger society. We can claim first for women of faith. Olympia Brown was the first woman to be ordained as clergy by a national denomination, the Northern Universalist Association but we are not immune to the pressures of our dominant culture, especially when its influence is unexamined. Historically, men have not ceded their power and influence easily or readily. And this has led to practices and cultures of misogyny within our congregations that are still thriving today. Like Newton's law of motion, unexamined privilege will continue until it's stopped by an outside force. Each of us here today have the power to be a force to interrupt misogyny in our congregations and our faith. And in 1977, the UUA made an overt attempt at interrupting the trajectory of unexamined patriarchal practices with the Women and Religion Resolution. 
It urged individual UUs and congregations to examine their use of gendered language and adherence to traditional cultural gender models. It named how this perpetuates harmful and limiting stereotypes. And such overt and explicit actions are a necessary part of shifting cultural values and practices. But they have their limits. Many of us are resistant to this type of guidance. And it can be difficult to make changes if they feel abstract to us as individuals, especially if one is in a category not directly affected. In this case, cisgender men. And this is not said to demonize men, but rather acknowledge a very real experience inherent to many. The dominant culture is designed to uphold itself. And therefore, divergence is at best uncomfortable and at worst, dangerous. But we're Unitarian Universalists, we're counterculture, and we're ready to be change makers. And yes, that's who we strive to be. So how do we become the faith and people that we strive to be? We learn our history so we can do our best to not repeat the missteps of the past and continue the good work of our forebears. We do the right thing even when it's uncomfortable and we don't let our privilege continue unexamined. One of my favorites from our history is Athalia Johnson Irwin. She was a strong Southern woman whose strength of character and devotion to her faith commanded wide respect. Irwin's story is a familiar one for many UUs. She grew up the daughter of a Baptist preacher in Arkansas in a conventional Civil War era Southern family. A crisis of faith as a young married woman led her to leave the Baptist church and search for something that spoke to her. She found universalism and a calling. And throughout her life, she preached of a loving God with unlimited salvation, completely opposite of her Baptist upbringing that taught God's love was only for those saved. And as many of you know, leaving the faith you grew up in is difficult. Even more so in the patriarchal Southern culture of the Civil War era. Holiday gatherings must have been awkward in Irwin's family. And to make it even more awkward, Athalia and her brother Mason G. Johnson, a Baptist minister, held a five-day public debate on religious doctrine at the Cottage Chapel where Athalia served in Little Rock, Arkansas. And this was a highly publicized event. But sadly, there's little record of what was said at the debate or whose arguments prevailed. But it does make one wonder if a patriarchal society was hesitant to admit that a female preacher gave a better argument for a God of universal love and unlimited salvation than her older brother. But in the end, it doesn't matter because Irwin's message of hope and salvation for all was shared widely. And I suspect this was Irwin's motivation for engaging in the debate. Irwin was always willing to put herself on the line to spread universalism's message of hope, love, and justice for all people. Irwin fiercely challenged prejudices within her own faith. When Northern Universalists suggested that universalism would not appeal to Southerners with little formal education. Irwin responded with a robust rejection of this baseless prejudice. Irwin was passionate in her belief that universalism was for all people, all the time, and she was always willing to make her voice heard. Irwin's belief in the hope of universal and unending love of God gave her the strength to persevere 
Eng Preach. She was courageous in the face of criticism of her gender and her faith. Erwin was highly sought after as a preacher, despite prejudices against female preachers, and quickly became a leading voice in universalism. And as you might know, Florida has very little involvement in our Unitarian Universalist history. But we do get to claim Athalia Johnson Irwin's ordainment in Pensacola, Florida in 1902. She was the first Southern woman to be ordained a Universalist minister. I'm so proud to belong to a faith that supported women faith leaders in a time when women did not have many rights. And I'm so thankful for Athalia Johnson Irwin's unending message of love, hope, and justice for all. And I wonder how our faith might have been different today if women like Athalia Johnson Irwin were able to practice their ministries as freely as the men of their time. How would our faith have grown if her criticisms were taken seriously and acted upon? Would our country be where it is today if Athalia were able to more broadly share her vision of universal salvation? These are unanswerable questions, but all hope is not lost. We still have opportunities to see what changes we can affect in our faith and in our world if we believe and uplift women if we do the work to root out misogyny from every corner. In our more recent history, colleagues of mine, Christina Rivera and Aisha Hauser, embody the spirit of Athalia Johnson Irwin. Their love for our shared faith is so strong, they risked their well-being and livelihoods to speak truth out loud. They are religious educators who came into the larger conversation of our UU faith in the spring of 2017. Christina Rivera bravely exposed the disconnect between the UUA's ideals and practices. This particular incident, incident was in hiring practices, but uncovered a pattern of our national association not living up to its vision. Christina, Aisha, and many others who voiced support for this deep examination of our values and practices as a faith were often harassed and disparaged. They received threats to their personal well-being and that of their families. To put it mildly, some very non-UU behavior was directed toward them then and still sometimes today. Yet they have remained steadfast in their dedication to helping this faith grow into its ideals. They worked with Kenny Wiley to create the white supremacy teaching movement as a response to these revelations. And today, they co-lead our online congregation, the Church of the Larger Fellowship, along with the Reverend Michael Tino. And together, they are boldly serving our faith and bringing our message of universal love and salvation, justice and equity to UUs incarcerated in our country and UUs all over the, the world. world. Our faith is richer because of their strength and dedication to our faith. But unfortunately, in our congregations, Women, trans, and non-binary folks face persistent misogyny still. It's not all overt, and I believe the majority of it is unintentional. And yet, it does not lessen the harm. Unexamined privilege is an explanation, but it's not an excuse. Our faith calls us to always be learning and growing we must be doing the work to uncover and excavate the remnants of dominant culture that are poisoning our congregations. It's an all too common story to see women, trans and non-binary people driven from congregational ministry and leadership. Our faith is longing for progressive leadership 
and yet we are driving away those whose calling is just that. There is an undercurrent of misogyny in many of our congregations, and rooting it out is the work of the congregants. Each of us has the power to till the soil, pull the weeds, and tend to the plants we want to grow. And in Florida, we know weeds. They pop up everywhere. And those of us who garden know it's best to pull them as soon as they pop up, lest they grow large enough to put out seeds and multiply. And we can do the same in our congregations. Don't let small remarks go unchallenged. Challenge them lovingly, of course, but don't let them go to seed. And just as we would seasonally turn a garden over, we need to regularly turn over our core beliefs. Are they aligned with our principles and values? Are there pockets of privilege clouding our understanding of each other? Maybe there's some roots left over from the patriarchy or the beliefs we long left behind. If we've cut down the tree but still left the roots, we still have work to do. Unearth them and put them in the compost. They're making it difficult for us to grow and deepen our faith. It matters what we believe, and we must tend to our beliefs just as we tend to a garden. Our beliefs won't feed us if we let weeds overtake them. In this work of uprooting misogyny, we need everyone to pitch in. And even though we often ask men to move back as a way to fight misogyny, we need them to leverage their privilege. As humans in this interconnected web, we have a responsibility to care for each other to fight for each other, to work to create the best possible world for each other. Women, trans, and non-binary folks have been fighting. If we are to win this literal fight for our lives, we need the men in our lives to do more. The fate and stories of UU women from the past and present would be different if more men were more vocal about the inequities and injustices of patriarchal systems. In these systems, men will always risk less and get more. And because we live in an interconnected web, this will always harm us all. But we can change that <clears throat> starting today. We can do the work that will ensure stories of tomorrow are different. We can be the faith that is so radically inclusive and equitable that the whole world will want to follow our lead. We can be irresistible to seekers of justice. We can be the ones who can truly say, it was once like that, but we made a commitment to a different path. May it be so. Sing like 
like the angels if you cannot speak before thousands you can give from deep within you you can change the world with your love love will guide us peace has dried us hope inside us will lead the I leave you with these words by the African-American poet, activist, teacher, and essayist, June Jordan. True commitment. In addition to the traditional concept of true commitment that means you are willing to die for what you think is right, make equal space for the womanly concept of commitment that means you are willing to live for what you believe. This next song is the uh, other side of Run For Your Life. <laughs> a little more positive, quite a bit more positive. And it's a song that John wrote around 1969 after we met Yoko Ono. And uh, feel free to sing along, it's fun. Love, 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 love. There's nothing you can do that can't be done. There's nothing you can sing that can't be sung There's nothing you can say but you can learn how to play the game It's easy There's nothing you can make that can't be made There's no one you can save that can't be saved there's nothing you can do, but you can learn how to be you in time. It's easy. All you need is love. All you need is love. All you need is love. Love. Love is all you need There's nothing you can know that isn't known There's nothing you can see that isn't shown There's no way you can be There isn't where you're meant to be It's easy All you need is love All you need is love All you need is love 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 is all you need All you need is love All you need is love Love, love 
Love is all you need. Love is all you need. Love is all you need. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you. Thanks for joining in. That was wonderful. That was, uh, I, in case you didn't hear me, that was wonderful. Um, we hope that you found meaning in today's service. And we close with these words from Maureen Kilrin. This is the message of our faith, to act with passion in the face of injustice, to love with courage in the midst of life's pain. This is the meaning of our chalice flame. May it empower our hearts until we are together again. Well, I guess we have a couple of announcements. Um, are you ready for this? Peter, you might like, you, you might like this, Peter. Groovy Woodstock Potluck <laughs> is Sunday, August 14th. Oh boy. Come celebrate the Festival of Peace and Love in the Social Hall after the service. Dig into your tie-dyed hippie clothes. Bring a retro 60s, 70s plate ready dish to share. There will be a 50-50 drawing to support hospitality and sign up. Sign up sheet is in the kitchen. Isn't that when they had ants on a log? Do you remember that? Yeah. Celery with cream cheese. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I went to a 60s party. Well, it was a, I can't tell you this party. Um, are there any other announcements that we need? I really appreciate all of you making the effort to distance and wear masks. Our congregation has... Um, Many of our congregants, or several of our congregants, have gotten this new B BA5 strain. They're not really ill, but they have to stay home. So please, when you can, wear your masks and distance yourselves. <laughs>